Well, welcome, and we're glad that you're joining us here for worship today on this uh, Sunday, right before the beginning of Lent, Transfiguration Sunday. We uh, thank you for being here, and there are a few announcements that we'd like to make before we begin worship. I hope that everyone has been able to see the Transformation Journey report that it was emailed out last week. If you have not been able to, to see that, uh, if you can just let Blake or myself know, and we are happy to email or print off a copy of that report so you can be looking over it. The next step for this transformation journey process is that we'll be holding two town hall meetings via Zoom. So you'll be able to actually uh, use your computer for these meetings, or you can use your phone and call in to these town halls. So as we, we as a church discuss uh, the report and and get, prepare ourselves for a charged conference in March to vote on whether to move forward with it or not. So please be looking over that report and pay attention soon as we announce when those uh, town hall meetings will happen. Messy Church is launching their February video here shortly. If you would like a Messy Church bag to go along with the activities and other things planned for this month's Messy Church, please contact Blake and reserve that for you. It should be ready by the end of the week, and so we just need to know how many of those bags to prepare. So please let Blake know as soon as possible. Youth is tonight at 5.30 on Zoom, so please check the Group Me app for links and uh, more communication about youth. Next Wednesday begins the journey of Lent. It is Ash Wednesday, and we're going to have a live streamed worship service at 7 p.m. that evening. If you got a a Lent in a box and are are preparing to, to... participate in all those activities, you'll have received a small bit of ashes there for that service, and uh, we encourage you to watch. Um, There will be a, uh, hopefully a Zoom meeting, and but also you can go to milfordhillsumc.org slash worship, and you can watch right there as well. Once again, that'll be live streamed on Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, uh, on the 17th at 7 p.m. Also, we are having a Linton Bible study to go along with the sermon series that we're doing. I'm a grade to Vega's new book, Savior. Uh, we will be looking at the different atonement theories during the season of Lent. If you'd like to participate in that, it starts Tuesday, uh, February 23rd, at 7 p.m. Uh, via Zoom. And you can pick up your book uh, at Cokesbury or Amazon. We have a mission here at Milford Hills United Methodist Church, which helps direct and guide us in what we do. And our mission here is to love, serve, and live as Christ. And that begins here in worship. So let us open up worship in prayer. Let us pray. The darkness of winter has been our companion, Lord. Now the days are lengthening. Bring light to us that we might see your glory and may work for you, offering hope and peace to this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
We come to a time of prayer in our service today. And this week we want to remember the family of Margaret Ketchy at her passing. We continue to remember Dot Free, June Scott, Linda Tuttero, and Sydney Parrish, and Cynthia Dwiggins. And if there are others on your heart, um, we just want you to lift those up wherever you may be right now as I move down to the altar to go to God in prayer. Heavenly Lord, we recognize and know that you are a wonderful creator. You are great, glorious, majestic, and holy. We praise you for being the awesome God that you are. And Lord, we know that you have created each person in this world. While we do our best to see your divine spark in each individual, Lord, we must confess that we fall short at this a lot. We judge others. We act superior to others. We are dismissive, unaccepting, and at times hold so much hate in our hearts towards your other wonderful creations. Lord, in your mercy, please forgive us for this. Help us to turn our backs on these behaviors and instead instead see others as you see them each and every day. Help us see one another as brothers and sisters. Help us to see one another as unique and special. And though we may be different from one another, help us to value and appreciate that diversity. Lord, for those that we have hurt or those who have hurt us, we pray that you would be present in those situations. Help us to reconcile where it is possible. Help us to forgive through your strength when that is possible for us. Help us to be representatives to those that need to know you, for they will know that we are Christians by our love. Lord, may our relationships reflect your love to all that we meet, because we know that you are truly a God of relationships. In fact, we know that you yourself, Lord, exist in constant relationships. For you are a God that is one in three persons, in constant loving connection. And holy God, in our connection with you and with one another, we also pray for those that we have mentioned to you this morning. Envelop each in your spirit so that they may recognize your presence, your peace, and your healing touch. And any others that we did not mention aloud but may be on our hearts today, May they feel the same. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus, who taught all his disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to tell you the story of the brothers Jacob and Esau, a story about tense relationships and reconciliation. There once were two twin brothers, Esau and Jacob. Esau, being the slightly older of the twins, was entitled to his father's inheritance and blessing. However, one day, Esau was busy working in the fields. He came famished and asked Jacob for some stew. Jacob said he would give him some if Esau transferred his inheritance to him. So Esau traded his birthright for some stew. While this seemed to be a mean trick by Jacob, it showed his intelligence and showed that Esau did not value his birthright. A while later, Jacob tricked his father into blessing him over Esau by dressing up as his brother and bringing him food. Since his father couldn't see well, he blessed Jacob. When Esau found out, he was devastated. It was twice now that he had been tricked by Jacob. Many years passed and the brothers lived separate lives as Jacob left their homeland. One day, the brothers decided to meet. They were each prepared for a battle, but Jacob displayed humility and presented gifts to Esau 
He prayed to God that Esau might forgive him. When they came face to face, Esau embraced his brother. Esau had forgiven him and was happy for his brother to be home. This story demonstrates the power of God to heal our broken relationships and gives us hope for a reconciliation. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for all the many relationships we have with others. However, many relationships are strained or broken. We ask for healing and forgiveness so our relationships might be whole. Amen. We come to a time of thanksgiving and offering in our service today. And I just wanted to offer a quick reminder to you. Um, please, when you make your gifts to the church, if you could write two separate checks for the general fund offering and also uh, a different ch check for the parsonage offering, just so we can differentiate those um, when they come in. We'd really appreciate that a lot. So let's go to God now through the giving of our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings. Let us pray and dedicate these gifts to God. God of grace and mercy, you are the source of the true healing that can make us whole. We remember this morning that Jesus' ministry was deeply involved in both healing of people's bodies and healing of relationships. As we take time now in worship to offer our gifts to you, we pray that they might be used to bring healing of body, of spirit, of broken relationships to people who are in desperate need. This we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Scripture today comes from the book of Genesis. We'll be reading in the 33rd chapter. And we'll be reading the first 11 verses. So hear now the word of God. Jacob looked up and saw Esau approaching with 400 men. Jacob divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and, two, and the two women servants. He put the servants and their children first, Leah and her children after them, and Rachel and Joseph last. He himself went in front of them and bowed to the ground seven times as he was approaching his brother. But Esau ran to meet him, threw his arms around his neck, kissed him, and they wept. Esau looked up and saw the women and children and said, Who are these? Who are these with you? Jacob said, The children of God generously gave your servant. The women servant and their children came forward and bowed down. Then Leah and her servants also came forward and bowed. And afterwards, Joseph and Rachel came forward and bowed. Esau said, What's the meaning of this entire group of animals that I meant? Jacob said, to ask for my master's kindness. Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what's yours. Jacob said, no, please do me the kindness of accepting my gift. Seeing your face is like seeing God's face since you've accepted me so, so warmly. Take this present that I've brought because God has been generous to me and I have everything I need. So Jacob persuaded him and he took it. 
This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be gracious and glorious to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So last week, uh, Pastor Kelly did an excellent job preaching about what it means to heal a community. To do so means he, he, she used the, uh, the passage about reaching out to grab the hem of Jesus' robe. The power of Jesus to heal our world is still there if we're ready and willing to reach out. To heal a community, though, a nation or world, sounds lofty and, and unreachable until you realize it starts with our personal relationships. If we are to embody the kingdom of God on earth, it starts with the relationships that we have with the people here on earth. As we seek to authentically live with one another, we seek to build the kingdom of God in the midst of the here and now. We live in a very divisive time. We are the divided states of America still. We are still the divided Methodist church. And if we truly are going to reclaim the united part of both of our nation and our denomination, then we have to learn to seek forgiveness and go even deeper to reconciliation. To heal a nation, a denomination, a community, means we need to start at the basic human level. We start at the relationships that we have with one another. There are, other, there are times in our lives when we are hurt by people and by situations. The December of Dean's first Christmas, the chair of my staff parish relations committee sat down with me. and He informed me that there was a financial error on the books. It, was, it wasn't anything that I did. It was just purely an accident. But in the error, it meant that they overpaid me by $700. To balance the budget and to make sure I was paid on what was voted for as my salary, he decided to take $700 out of my last paycheck, which back then was about 50% of it. There was no other option in his book. The meeting was cold and emotionless. He saw a problem. He saw the simplest solution and cut my paycheck, my last paycheck of the year in half. Let's just say it wasn't a very Merry Christmas that year. I, I was bitter angry and upset about how he approached that meeting in this situation. And when I left that church six months later, the situation still bugged me and it bugged me for a while. I was hurt. And I don't even know if the chair realized what he did or how that decision affected me and my family. I don't know. And I may never know, but that hurt lasted a long time. Maybe you've had a similar hurt. Maybe you have been wronged by someone. Maybe you've been fighting with a family member, a spouse, a child, a coworker. Maybe you're in such in the middle of such pain or anger, grief or frustration that you cannot see yourself out of it. We all have moments in life when this happens. And if we are followers of Christ, then we need to learn how to heal from these. And when the timing is right, Reconcile with one another. If Jacob and Esau were together, they were fighting. In Genesis 25, it tells the story of Rebekah's pregnancy. Rebekah had, hadn't been able to give birth, and, and Isaac had prayed that she, they could have children. And so in Genesis 25, verse 21, it starts to say this. The Lord was moved by Isaac's prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. But the boys pushed against each other inside her. And she said, if this is what it's like, why did it happen to me? So she went and asked the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two different people will emerge from your body. One people will be stronger than the other. The older will serve the younger. When she reached the end of her pregnancy, she discovered that she had twins. The first came out red all over, clothed with hair, and she named him Esau. Immediately afterwards, his brother came out gripping Esau's heel, and he and she named him Jacob. Now, I guarantee you, Rebecca shared that story with Esau and Jacob any chance she had in life. I am sure she reminded them that they fought in utero and growing up all the time. When there are two or more kids, kids 
are going to fight. I have two perfect only children. It's just when they hang out together that things start to get heated. I'm pretty sure my mom, a mother of four, spent most of her time awake screaming at me and my sisters because of all the fighting that we did with one another. Now, Dustin did a fantastic job in his video to explain kind of what Esau and Jacob did as they grew up and how Jacob had wronged Esau so much, stole his birthright and blessing. As the oldest son, Esau was given certain things, but Jacob took all of that away. He cheated and stole to get favor from his father. These two brothers couldn't get along in the womb, and they couldn't be more divided or far away from each other when we get to this piece of scripture here today. In Genesis 32, the chapter before this story, Jacob goes through a lot of emotions. Jacob had realized that he needed to leave his father-in-law. He's making plans to be uh, to part, and God sends a messenger to Jacob. The messenger tells him that he's going to meet Esau. Genesis 32, 6 says, The messenger returns to Jacob and says, We went out to your brother Esau, and he's coming to meet you with 400 men. Jacob was terrified and felt trapped. And so he divided the people with him and the flocks, cattle, and camels into two camps. He thought if Esau meets the first camp and attacks it, at least one camp will be left to escape. Fear of seeing his brother the one he wronged so much, sends him to scheming so that he doesn't lose everything. He figures out what he's going to do, and then he sets his plan into motion. He sends a very generous gift to Esau to appease him. He sends 200 female and and 20 male goats, 200 female and 20 male sheep, 30 nursing camels and their young, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female and 10 male donkeys. Esau could have started a whole nother lazy five ranch with the amount of animals that Jacob is sending him. He did this because he's afraid that Esau is going to kill him. This hairy outdoorsman, the jock of the family, was coming with 400 men to meet Jacob, and a bloody result was all that Jacob could comprehend as the ending of this meeting. It sent him into an emotional frenzy, and and after getting his family across the river, he decided he needed to spend some time alone. That night, he wrestles with a mysterious man, something, it was an angel or even God. And either way, when Jacob wakes up, he names the place where he slept Peniel, because it is where he saw God face to face. The next morning, things had changed in Jacob. The passage that I read, there there doesn't seem to be any of this fear that is inside Jacob. Instead of putting people in front of him, he is the one who walks out in front of his servants and his, his wives. He bows before Esau seven times. Esau doesn't kill Jacob. Instead, in this glorious moment, he runs out to him, throws his arms around him, kisses him, and together they weep. In a place of a horrible fight, we get one of the most dramatic moments of reconciliation in the Bible. It brings up memories of of what we read later on in the New Testament of the father of the prodigal son, or later on in Genesis when Joseph embraces his brother Benjamin. But what has changed? And what do we learn from these two brothers embracing instead of fighting? Let's look at the two different brothers' sides. Let's look from Jacob, the offender, and Esau, the injured party. How do they approach this meeting? And what can we learn if we're going to heal some of our own relationships? Jacob was scared to death in the previous chapter, but after coming face to face with God, that fear has seemed to leave him. What does the night before a big moment in your life feel like? Maybe it's a night before surgery. Maybe it's right before announcing a divorce or the morning before a funeral. It feels like that evening you are wrestling with God. You have tossed and turned all night, wondering what would happen, playing through every single type of scenario in your head. You have thought about everything, planned for everything, considered it all, and prayed through it all. But then the morning comes, and there's nothing left to do except go through. Maybe this is where Jacob's heart was. 
He had done all he could. He had sent a gift ahead to Esau. He had made plans and divided up his family to protect them. He had done everything, and now he has to face his brother. And since he did, he could face him with vulnerability. We can see that his actions as he bows down before Esau seven times, as he calls Esau Lord and himself servant. To, to, he makes himself, you know, puts him at Esau's mercy. There seems to be something genuine in Jacob's approach, approach this time. This was a master manipulator and scoundrel, but not in this moment. Here, there is an authentic desire to make amends. This comes through in a way that Jacob talks and acts when he meets his brother. I grew up and my mom always had this phrase that she used all the time as I went through the tweens and teen years. I would make a mistake, the same one over and over again, like fighting with my sisters. And I would come to her and apologize for my behavior. And she would say, sometimes I'm sorry just isn't good enough. She was telling me that my words needed to be backed up by my actions. If I was truly sorry, if I truly meant it, then I would change what I was doing continually. I would stop getting in trouble for the same exact thing. Jacob has seemed to learn and grow through wrestling with God that night. And his actions are meeting his desire to be forgiven by his brother. If you were to, if you wrong someone, If you wronged another person in your life, what type of approach would it take from you to heal that relationship? If you gossiped about a coworker or a neighbor, how would you approach that person and ask for forgiveness? To heal that relationship, we could take notes from Jacob. We would need to approach with humility and vulnerability and be genuine with our desire to be forgiven for what we have done. To do this means that, we put your, that you put yourself at the mercy of the other person. Jacob does this and was willing to accept whatever fate he desired. This is, because, this is because something changed in Jacob. He doesn't fall down in front of Esau and grovel for forgiveness, but his words and his deeds let Esau know that he is truly sorry. If you are approaching a person you may have offended or wronged in another manner, reconciliation may not happen because you may not have done the hard work inside to admit to yourself what you have truly done. You haven't wrestled with God over your past actions and you truly were, and truly were sorry for them yet. When we walk up to someone ready to heal that relationship, we need to be in the same mindset as Jacob. We are truly sorry for what we have done, and we are ready to face the music for it. Now, on the other side, with the other twin, the older, who was ruled by the younger, Esau. Let's look at him. What do we learn from him as as someone approaching another person who's wronged us? How do we heal a relationship when we are the injured party, either physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually? This is a unique scene when Esau embraces his brother. Like I mentioned before, like the prodigal son's father coming out, wrapping him up in love and forgiveness. Esau does the same thing. He bear hugs Jacob, kisses him, and then they weep together in this embrace. Someone who holds a grudge, that wouldn't happen. Someone who is still living in the midst of pain and that hurt doesn't do this. Only a person who has let go those wrongdoings embraces a brother like this. Only someone who has done the hard work and the long work of forgiving someone deep in their heart can weep in the clinch of a brother who has taken so much away from him. Now, I haven't seen that SPRC chair who ruined my first Christmas with my son since I left that church. Now it's been almost 14 years since that moment, and I have moved on. I've forgiven him and his short-sightedness. The emotions and the tension and the anger isn't as raw as it is now. The, the wound has healed and it's scarred up. And while writing this sermon, I wonder how I would approach him if he approached me like Jacob did. My gut tells me he probably never realized that he did anything wrong because he was a businessman and that's what businessmen do and think. 
But if he truly had a change of heart and sought me out to be forgiven, I'd forgive him because I gave that pain to God long ago. When we are wounded, we need time to heal. We need time to get distance from that place emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. We need time to pass from that situation. Esau had decades between the time his birthright and blessing were stolen from Jacob and the time they met. Esau grew up and had a great life and was successful. And when he sees the gifts from Jacob, he turns them down initially. He doesn't want Jacob's pity or gifts of uh, appeasement. He doesn't want his forgiveness to be bought, and so he rejects it. He tells Jacob, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what's yours. But Jacob offers the gift again. But this time, it's not a concession, but a gift of gratitude. Jacob says in verse 10, No, please, do me the kindness of accepting my gift. Seeing your face is like seeing God's face, since you've accepted me so warmly. Take this present that I've brought Because God has been generous to me, and I have everything that I need. Esau sees the gift now, not as a way to buy forgiveness, but to give thanks to God who Jacob sees in the moment that they embrace each other. Esau was ready to forgive his brother, and Jacob truly sought forgiveness from his brother. When this type of reunion happened, God's glory is shown. The New Interpreter's Bible Commentary says this about this passage. It says, The life one lives with God and the life one lives with other human beings are two sides of the same coin. Our personal relationships mirror our relationships with God. If we are truly seeking forgiveness and are truly forgiving others, then the kingdom of God is at hand. The communities heal. Nations and denominations, they unite. We must strive to approach people with the same love that God has for us. This reality was on full display the moment between these two brothers. If we are to heal, who do we need to seek forgiveness from? And who do we need to forgive? It is in these raw and genuine moments that we truly come face to face with God. And all God's people said, Amen. So let us now pray. And we're gonna, I'm going to pray a, a prayer of confession from the United Methodist Book of Worship. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, We know that when we offend others, we offend you. We are aware that we have often allowed the shadow of hate to cloud our souls, hiding the light from our unseeking eyes. We have unpleasant and hurtful things. We have said unpleasant and hurtful things to our brothers and sisters when they fail to live up to our expectations. Grant that we might find that spark of love that ever burns within us the love that you have shown us, even when we failed you. Fan the embers of that love until it roars again in flames of love, peace, and reconciliation. Forgive us our sins and help us to forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us into a new life through your son, Jesus Christ, who died for the sins of all. Amen. And now hear this benediction. Go now from this place in order to heal the world, starting with our own relationships. May the face of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be seen in the way that we love and forgive our fellow human beings. Go in peace. Amen.